I was talking about this the other day with my partner that like the dates you go on that don't involve drinking or anything like or parties kind of feel like dates you would have gone on at like 14 years old. Yes. You know, should we go see a movie? Should we? Yeah. Should we go bowling? And then you do that shit and you're like, yeah, this, this slaps. This is so much better. <laughs> also, it costs, it costs $200 less. I'm knocking doors down with Steven Jopp, a.k.a. Stevie. Why did I want to talk to Steven? Steven is a Canadian-born actor who's been in numerous roles. As well, Stevie is the lead singer of the Toronto-based alternative rock band Birds of Bellwoods. I got hooked on their stuff, and I found out Stevie has had some various mental health struggles. As well, when we get into this conversation, you'll find out he's becoming more and more sober curious and even expresses that uh, there might come a time where total abstinence is going to be the way that he has to live his life. He's such an awesome dude, totally open. This was such an amazing talk, and I'm really appreciative of it, and I know you guys are going to dig it. Also, check out his band. I put the links in the podcast description. Birds of Bellwoods, totally killer stuff, and the lyrics thematically deal a lot with mental health and mental health struggles. While you're checking knocking doors down out, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you get a lot out of this podcast, share with a friend. And don't forget the archive of interviews we have. Bam Margera, Brandon Novak, Kat Von D, Charlie Sheen, Edward Furlong, Kelly Osborne. The list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives. Speaking of purpose, how about a lifestyle brand with purpose? 5150 LTM. That's right. Not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life, but they give back to the community. And you, the listener of Knocking Doors Down, get 20% off every time you shop at 5150 LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. Their three amazing programs, the race to end the stigma, the race for autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. Well, I was in rock radio for 20 years, so uh, when I got... Oh, shit. Yeah, when I got the single, I was like, I would have added this fucking song, man. Like, well, from your word, from your mouth to God's ears, man, because uh, it, it the radio has been slow to pick up. Radio in Canada always has a little bit of a lag uh, yeah. after you drop a song, unless you're one of the like kind of faithfuls of it. There's like six bands in Canada that they could literally uh, fart into a microphone and you can guarantee that it, it's at least going to go to top 10. Um, but for the rest of us, we kind of have to wait our turn and it can be six months, even a year after an album drops before, uh, we finally get around to lo- ro- rotation. So I'm really <laughs> glad that you enjoyed the song. I hope other people are having that response as well. Uh, yeah. and that none of those bands release any music for at least the next two months. <laughs> uh, fu- uh, okay. I would have to guess the six bands that like, Oh, please do. All right. So I'm, I, well, no rush. Can't put anything new out. Well, they could, but it wouldn't be rush. <laughs> um, uh, one of my guilty pleasures, Nickelback. I'm yeah. Guessing. Yeah. They weren't who I was thinking. I'm thinking less active rock and more alternative but yes i think okay. if nickelback dropped a song they would absolutely end up in the top 10 no matter what it was boy alternative uh, uh they're all very me. canadian give it to me Ooh. oh i don't know um okay i would say that if i mean here's the thing i should i should give this disclaimer should anyone see this <laughs> all of these bands make very good music Oh, the songs are so good. They deserve to be on the radio. We're also (laughs) lucky to hear them every day. Every time I turn on the radio to hear these songs, at least three times in a half hour drive. Um, But I would say, who would I say? I would say Arkells, Sam Roberts, The Beaches, July Talk. Uh, Those four, certainly, if they put out a song, we are going to hear that song a lot. And until recently, I'd say maybe Arcade Fire too, but I think they might be out of the radio game for a little bit. Yeah, I think so. 
Uh, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, good, good band, good band, but uh, a anyway. lot of good members of that band. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk, fi- figure it out. Great track. Yeah. Heard it. Hook. Fun. Uh, the video was great. You know, thanks, it, it, man. It told a cool story. Uh, but we're, lyrically, really, what kind of inspired that? Uh, the same thing that inspires so much of my music, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, those thoughts that spin around your head as you're trying to fall asleep uh, that you're absolutely not going to solve at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., uh, but you can't quite chase away. Um, yeah, that song is really about feeling like no matter how hard you work, you can't really escape uh, this gnawing cycle of self-doubt um, and the fear that you'll never overcome it and that you'll never arrive at the place that you hoped that you would or the level of success that you know you're capable of. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, yeah. fun yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. I, I know it all too well. Yeah. <laughs> it it helped me uh, have that it led me towards crawling into the bottom of a bottle for a long time. I feel that. Yeah. I've definitely, I've, I have my own means of escape as well. I'm not quite on the sobriety train yet, but I've definitely had some moments recently where I'm, uh, I I feel that it's in my future. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Uh, I can definitely see time. I had a family member of mine recently who got sober and I'm seeing the incredibly positive effect that it's had on his life mm-hmm. and his relationships and his relationship to himself. Uh, and it's really inspiring. Um, and also that he hasn't lost any of himself or the things that make him such a gregarious and charming person, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think there's a fear when we move away from things like that, that like, well, well, how will I interact with people? How am I going to go to a party without getting fucked up? Um, and then just seeing him be able to overcome that. I'm like, okay, so I could do it. Yeah. No, you nailed it. That's that though what you shared is exactly what I went through especially in the first year like how how am I going to relate to people? Uh how long I, has it been for you? Uh I'm on 2 years now. I had two and a half before that. I fell off during the pandemic. Um, uh, man, if there was ever a, a situation that was going to bring someone back to it. Yeah, well, for me it really was a, I lost that sense of community, which I need. I'm I'm more of an introvert, but if you get me around people that I know and love, mm. it, it comes out. Or if there's a nice paycheck behind it, I'm pretty good. <laughs> like, yeah. put me up on a stage, cool, no problem. I'm actually more comfortable there than I would be sitting in the crowd. Um, Seconded. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, so it's just a, it was a boundary issue with someone that I shouldn't have kept in my life, and and they're mm. better off without me in their life too. Man, mm-hmm. it's just allowing my boundaries to be pushed, but you know, yeah, uh, but all that. those well, congrats on coming back to two years, man. That's incredible. Thanks. I appreciate that, bro. Yeah, it was, uh, it, I don't want to say, you know, everybody has their journey for me. Obviously it was a necessary part of it, mm-hmm. you know, but eh, you know, it's, uh, it's been good. I'm still working on it. I'm still, I still struggle with some things, you know, in a pretty good relationship. So that's, that's rare. Cause that first is like, how do I talk to women? How do I date sober? How do I, you know? Right. What do you, what, what's a date that doesn't involve getting a drink? Right. It didn't for me. Am I gonna, am I, are we going to an obstacle course? Are we <laughs> a mini is that the game now? This feels weird. I was talking about this the other day with my partner that like the dates you go on, that don't involve drinking or anything like or parties kind of feel like dates you would have gone on at like 14 years old. Yes. You know, should we go see a movie? Should we? Yeah. Should we go bowling? And then you do that shit and you're like, yeah, this, this slaps. This is so much better. <laughs> also it costs, it costs $200 less. <laughs> All right. Oh yeah. yeah. No, I definitely saved a lot of money, but, but you're right. I, and I think, like before we hit record, I was talking, you know, I got a couple bookshelves full of Star Wars Legos and that's my first <laughs> sponsor was like, what did you do when you were a kid? Uh, you know, baseball, basketball. I like to build Legos. Boom. Here's a gift card to the Lego store. Get back to it. You know, so oh, it's yeah, like man. like those cool, cool, you know, pure just like, yeah, just like 
where you sit and actually enjoy yourself by yourself. For sure. And I also find that like, you know, when, when I am sober, the creativity flows so much more smoothly and so much more with so much more regularity mm. and the thoughts are so much clearer. Mm. Um, and like, I definitely create from a lot of different states and a lot of places, but I've found that lately, honestly, I think I'm distracting myself with like going out and getting fucked up and shit like that. And I'm kind of using it as a way to get around the work because I think there's always a fear that whatever you make next isn't going to be as good or sure. that you've run out of things to say. Um, so I think I keep myself away from the keyboard and, and, and away from the paper. Uh by by kind of uh just surrounding myself with noise sure uh and and i'm i think yeah i'm starting to come to a place where you know yeah if we do this again in a year it'll be funny to see where i am <laughs> i'll be like not yet worse than ever or i'll be like yeah check out all my legos oh uh, well i love you for the honesty though yeah man i figured why not i'm life's too short you know yeah well in I find for me, and I'm still struggling, I wore a lot of masks for a lot of people, but I'm getting to where those that are around me, I'm only genuine and authentic. And if you don't like me, I no longer care. Hmm. And I, I, that's fine. It's a wonderful thing to come to. I think I still struggle with that. It's funny because like, you know, we're having this conversation. I'm realizing that like, there's a lot of uh, aspects of your journey that you're describing that I really resonate with, but I see sure. myself uh, on a much earlier phase of that journey, you know, because I'm, I'm at a point now, you know, with therapy as well, where I can recognize uh, how important it is to me to be liked by other people. Mm. Uh, but I can also recognize that that's not necessarily a good thing, right? I had this conversation with my therapist recently <laughs> where I was talking about this particular person in my life um, who I worked with creatively, who I could just tell they didn't fucking vibe with me. And I was racking my brain and I was like, why, like, why, you know? And, and, and it was keeping me up at night. And she was like, Stevie, do you like everyone? And I was like, no, no, there's a lot of people I don't like. And she was like, does that make them bad people i go no we just we're just different she goes okay so do you think that could apply to you sometimes too that maybe you're just different than people and it's okay if they're not necessarily up for it because you're a lot and i am a lot <laughs> <laughs> um and i was like hmm no they have to like me <laughs> uh, but I'm working on it because she's right. She's right. You can't like everyone. No, and it doesn't make them bad people. No, no, it's just a different vibe. And it doesn't make you a bad person if somebody's energy is just different. You know, people who are like totally OK, just being silent, like sitting in silence. You're like driving and they're good to just no radio, no chat, no chit chat. Just fucking whoosh. I got 30 seconds in me before I'm like, ah, this is a weird looking tree, huh? <laughs> no, I've seen some trees in my day. I'll just start talking. And yeah, and it makes me really like uncomfortable. Um, but like, you know, just because they're good uh, with their place in the universe and just, you know, listening to the wind on the plains, like oh, that doesn't mean I have to fill that space. I'm with you on that. And it's, it's hard. Like, um, I work for a nonprofit as well. And the founder, he's also become a pretty good mentor to me. And he's giving me like that challenge to go home, power everything off. And you are going to sit in your room just with yourself mm. and your thoughts and focus on your breathing. And oh. it's like, try, try like 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and I can't, I've done breath work stuff where it's, it's a group. And there's like some music and tones and different stuff going and some instruction. I've done that for an hour, but I can't when it's just sitting with myself. Uh, I mean, like, I'm like, well, boy, you know, what's going on? Did I leave the gas on it? You know, it's like right? my brain will go to what? The strangest things. And if there's nothing immediately, if there's nothing in your immediate vicinity, the gas or any shit like that, then you'll go back to like, 
you remember that time in grade four <laughs> when I said that weird thing? What was that about? And I'm like, why? Why? Why are we? Bring, why does this feel like the time to address that? Oh. Yeah, man. I used to like there. You know, last year I was in a pretty good place. Um, I think honestly I was in a bit of a manic episode, but I I was keeping pretty good charge of it. I had a lot of plates spinning, mm. but I was just really able to maintain it. And I was doing a lot of meditation, and I was doing some prayer. Um, like I had a I had a I had a routine every single day. I would start my day. I'd have the fucking hot water with lemon and then I'd do a big workout and then I'd do yoga and then I would meditate for like 10, 15 minutes and then I'd do prayers and then I'd journal and I'd do some writing. It was like a three hour thing that I did every morning. But then like of course, as with anyone with compulsion issues, that then became an addiction in of, of itself, right? If I didn't get that kind of morning every single day, then my whole day was fucked up. Right. Um, but then beyond that, then at the end of the year, some shit went down and it really just all came apart. Um, and I went into a really dark place. I was more depressed than I think I've been in, in, in years and years. And I started having to see my therapist like a lot more regularity. Cause I was, I was, I was, I was getting a little close to the old self checkout aisle. Mm. Um, and I'm coming back now and I'm doing a lot better. Uh, and especially since having released the album and just having this thing out into the world, having my thoughts expressed, hearing people resonate with them, uh, feeling not so alone. It's getting better, but I can't I can't get back to the meditation or really the prayer part yet. There's something in me that is still not ready. I do my working out. I do my yoga. I'm journaling. I'm writing. But the the silence and the peace are still escaping me. Um, but I'm hopeful that I'm going to find my way back. I'm hopeful. I'm feeling positive. Well, I'm but hopeful. I'm also being patient with myself, if that makes sense. Good. As you should. And I'm hopeful and I'm, uh, I'm, I have faith that you will find mm -hmm. your way back to that. It, it, but it's tough, man. It, like <laughs> so much of life can, things just can derail different things you know it's it's and the it's smallest tough. things can build and then they can topple it can be this huge domino effect one thing can go wrong and that can create a chain reaction where suddenly everything goes wrong and then simultaneously we're we're buffeted on all sides at all times with the, the your phone's dinging and your computer and you know uh, because now you have your, your email in your pocket at all times you're expected to be available everywhere and if you're an actor and a musician or like y you were describing many of the things that you do like you you're you're six different people right mm -hmm. and people need you to be at one point through a one day you have to be all of those people you know so it's just like it's hard to find peace because the moment that you stop and breathe you remember something else that yeah. you were supposed to do yeah. all this obligation and expectation um yeah. and finding finding the space between uh it being uh invigorating and overwhelming i think is like is is the journey or part of it well i can only imagine for you, I mean, you're an incredibly talented individual, you know, it's... I I'm mean, okay. You... I'll do in a pinch is the way I like to put it. <laughs> I give yourself a little more fucking credit. I can, I, I'll dude, leave that I, to you. I am totally vibing with you because I'm a self-deprecating son of SLB myself, man. Like, Yes, sir. People like, oh, you know, I listened to this episode and it changed my life or something like yeah, the guest was great. No, it's something you said. Well, they inspired me to say that. And it's like, yeah. so, like, thank Find you. Find any reason why why you weren't the good part, right? It, yeah, exactly. It's just like, where, where where's the thing? And that's an egotistical approach too, you know? Yeah. Just like the person that's like, says I'm the greatest, the one that goes, I'm the worst person to ever live. It's like, are you really? Like on either edge, are you really? It's funny, right? Because it's narcissism. Yeah. To have and and I recognize like, you know, I'm 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 coping with my own narcissism right now and like every day. But like to say you're the best or to say you're the worst is still putting yourself 
on a on a like it's such an extreme level of the spectrum that you're like really you're the worst you're the worst no you're probably just fucking somewhere <laughs> around here you're probably not that noticeable you're yeah. you're another blue thread in the tapestry yeah but it's yeah. it Oh, it's really interesting. And narcissism yeah. also saves lives, you know? True. <laughs> it's great. Like, I've definitely been the benefactor of, of my own narcissism because I, for sure, you know, self-importance has kept me from harming myself. Sure. Because I've gone, I, can, I can't leave because I can't deprive the world of that which I could still make. Yeah. And it's horrendous to think about, but it's also like, yo, if that's what kept me here, then uh, it, it can't be so bad. No, I, and I don't think so. I I recently had a um, comedian on his his special was called "Up Here Killing Myself," and it's a brilliant special, and and he interweaves uh, therapy sessions, so it's like he's you, you're like you're his wow. therapist. Yeah, his name's Josh Johnson, and so you're sitting there. It goes black and white when he's with his therapist, and he'll say a word, and it cuts immediately to where it is in his stand up. And at the end, he basically says, "You know, without this, uh, he says thank you, and you know, uh, with without this, I, I probably would have taken my life a long time ago." Mm. And boy, I you know, there's been very few comedians that have made me laugh and cry, and he's one of them. Like with music, man, I, I artists can take me from la like smiling to crying in like thirty seconds. You know, music mm. is still one of my escapes. Uh, although I'm a shitty musician myself, I sure try. But what I'm do you play? Uh, guitar. You strike me as a drummer. I've tried. I can't detach my limbs. I can't play anything it's off hard, time. Right. So I got my little electronic kit in the background there. I've been yeah. learning. My drummer is teaching me um, and I'm slowly learning. But yeah, that's the hardest stuff, right? The whole like pat your head. Rub your tummy, <laughs> exactly. And this with your feet. And it and it shows through. I'm taking uh, so my kids do piano lessons and I'm taking bass lessons. I had started like 20 years ago, gave up, and you know I can noodle around some things or you know half-ass play some stuff. But you know now I'm like really digging in, and it's still like coming in on the and mm -hmm. fucks me up every time. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I do. I hear you, man. I'm a, a very basic instrumentalist, like. There's still a lot of chords I do not know how to play on this keyboard or that guitar and stuff. That's why I'm thankful to be in a band. I'm, I'm surrounded by incredibly talented musicians and I can just come at it with a very rudimentary structure, my lyrics, my ideas, my melodies. And then Adrian and, and Chris, um, and Dylan, and when Kentaro was part of the band, Kentaro can kind of expand that and turn it into... A, a song like we end up with on the record and and that i think is is the special sauce but are you so are you you going after the family band vibe no i don't think so my kids are really into classical which is cool i dig it you know <laughs> like like it's cool the first time they saw an that was the most creating distance between you and them it's cool ever uh, well, I I'm a rock. I'm a yeah. well, I like everything, but primarily rock. Like you know, uh, at about classical rocks, man. Oh, it does. There's oh. that that shit hits hard. My daughter's a Chopin fan, and I'm listening to it the other day, and I go, Chopin's like the original metalhead, and she's like, What are you talking about? I'm like, Listen to the speed at which like he plays, like his his pieces are written. Like this sounds like metal. In yeah. a lot of ways, you know, For sure. so, so I dig it. So no, it's not a matter of like, like, oh no, classical it's music. Cool. <laughs> I, I enjoy it, but primarily you're going to hear me throwing on some rock metal. I was a big Prince fan growing up, stuff like that. But he know. stole our drummer from a metal band. Uh, well, he still plays in a bunch of metal outfits, but when we found him, he was playing metal. Um, and I hadn't actually seen him play live. It was after we'd been playing together for a little bit that, cause he just came so highly recommended. And then when he played with us, we were like, this guy's incredible. But we went after like touring together for about a year, he had a gig with another project of his. And I went and I saw him live and he's doing like 180 BPM double kick, like 30 <laughs> second notes on the kick. And, and I'm just watching and, and I'm like, going 
on here? This is insane. He gets off stage and I'm like, so when you're playing with us, you're like basically clearing your throat. Okay? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, it's hard too. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's different. I get it. It's all different. Right. It's, it's, it's as hard to play for on the floor as anything else, but no, Mu- like metal musicians, you're going to find some of the most talented people, some of the most talented instrumentalists, I think, in, in all music, metal and jazz. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, my kid's instructor, he's a jazz musician and my, my girlfriend and I, we went and watched him at a, a friend of ours club. They had a uh, one year anniversary and he's up there with a the lady, very Etta James style vocal and just the stuff that he's doing and the phrasings. And like my knowledge of music is is bigger than my ability to play it and so you know how old are the are your kids uh 13 and 14 two pains in the asses oh god 13 and 14 Uh uh-huh so you are just arriving at the worst possible years oh yeah this is exciting did you did you see the moment that they became teenagers Mm mm-hmm Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. My, so my son, like my dad was an addict as well. So that 14 year old headbutting with dad shit, I never mm. got to do. He wasn't really around that much then. We're close now. Uh, and he's been clean for 20 something years. Uh, so I never got to do it. So mm-hmm. like to my son, I'm probably the, like the biggest idiot on the planet until, you know, something's needed. Whereas my youngest, you know, we get along great, but she's full of attitude as well. And, you know, it's they coming. Know, yeah. They know everything, bro. They know everything. Yeah. I know. There's that saying, forget, I think it's Oscar Wilde. He said, I'm not young enough to know everything. <laughs> like, the confidence. Uh-huh. It's so, it's, it's incredible to me. Cause uh-huh. you're like, but you don't. But I know for certain that you don't know this. That you were wrong about this, and they're like, "No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep running with this. I'm very, con- I'm, I'm that confident." It's, and then I was thinking about it the other day. I was thinking about you know going back to even younger. I was watching this. I was on, I was on the bus. I was watching this kid just weep, right, mm-hmm. like kids do, like a four year old kid. I don't know. He would had a bad day at the science center or whatever, and with his mom and he's just crying and she's doing everything she can just to like calm down be like hey we're going home we're gonna have some dinner why not he's just weeping and weeping and i'm like do you remember what it was like to feel something Hmm. that much like that must be exhausting yeah it's hard being a kid and -hmm. then they become a teenager and everything just shuts down yeah or gets overridden with a shit ton of hormones and a lot of confusion. Yeah, it's a hard time. And it's harder now than ever. Oh, God, yes. I feel like, so when I was 14, Facebook like just kind of happened. Mm. You know, like I think it, it, it had happened for a bit, but it wasn't like everyone wasn't expected to have a Facebook and Instagram <laughs> and all this shit. It right. wasn't like you didn't have this from the time that you were eight years old. You weren't like born onto Instagram. And I can't imagine that I had a hard enough time and to have had that kind of social pressure surrounding me as I was at an age where I was just starting to sort myself out. I don't envy it. And I feel like it can't possibly be good for the world. I I agree. I spoke at a, a couple of high school classes a few weeks ago. And they were primarily uh, young women in the class. Shared a bit of my story, and we just got in conversation about addiction, mental health. And one of the young ladies asked about that. Like, you know, she was blatant, you know, because I was talking about one of my concerns is the overly sexualizing of uh, young people, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. I mean, you've worked in entertainment forever, you've seen it forever. But now it's just over amplified. And she was just like, yeah, it's not it's not always just like some guy or a girl comparing me to them like like literally my mom. You know, like, yeah, hey. like, like, wh- wh- why are you wearing that? That makes you look fat or, you know, why, why aren't you doing your makeup and your hair? And, you know, and it's just this this abundance of things. And 
and the best advice I could give. And I said, one thing I had to learn was I could no longer um, worry about how somebody's outsides made my inside feel. I, I mm. couldn't compare the two anymore. It, it mm. was a waste of time. It was a waste of life, you know, uh, yeah. for the longest time, you know, I wanted to be, you know, Tommy Lee, Nikki six cool and, you know, rock guy. And, you know, and it was all just a bullshit mask and layer of, of things to protect myself. And, mm. and I said, I'm certainly not trying to, I'm not getting your mom's side of the story, but at the end of the day, you have to love you. And, and like, that's a must, you know, nobody else is going to do that shit for you. They're the, the Hollywood soulmates and all that. It's all crap. There's only one soulmate. Look in the mirror. That's you. Yeah. You know? And so as um, I agree with you, the, these young people nowadays are facing shit that I couldn't imagine facing. Like we're, I mean, we're facing it as adults and we're wholly, uh, un, un, like incapable of dealing mm -hmm. with it. I'm I'm 31 now and Instagram makes me feel like shit. And I I like to think I'm I you know, I've developed some coping me mechanisms and whatnot. Again, like 10 years of therapy have taught me a little bit how to navigate this. Um although my therapist is like a 76-year-old Jewish woman and I ever <laughs> mention Instagram, she's like, "And remind me what that is again." <laughs> like, God Damn it, Francine. I can just say Stevie now. Just tell yeah. me that, Bobola. <laughs> she she says she's like, okay, kid, what's going on? Uh, <laughs> that's how we start every every session. But like, that's my thing. I'm 31. I can't deal with this shit. How are they expected to at 14? Mm -hmm. When they the coping mechanisms that they have are are undeveloped and oftentimes like deeply unhealthy, right? You got to try on a lot of things it's funny what you were saying about um the kind of people that we idolize when we're young yeah because i was I, what that kind of brought up for me is it i feel like we have these different idols as we're getting older uh but they're not people that we know right not really like we idolize them because we don't know them um so we're able to build them up in our head and create this kind of fantastical version of them and i feel like it's almost because we're trying on different versions of ourselves, right? Mm. So there's something in them that calls out to something that you want to be or that you see in yourself that you could become. Yeah, I agree. Then you meet them one day and you're like, oh, God damn it. Piece <laughs> of shit. <laughs> ruin that for me. And then you go home and you take the T-shirt out from your closet and throw it in the uh, trash. You, see, you sound like you speak from that with experience. I have met a few people. I have met one actor and one musician in my life. Uh, I've met a lot of really wonderful people who I idolized as well, who lived up to the expectation that I had of them, which was uh, absurd and insurmountable. But I have met one actor and one musician, and they absolutely, it broke my heart. Mm. to meet and to speak to them and for them to be so careless with the part of me that loved them so much. Right. Cause in me, there's still that kid that looked up to them and that, that, you know, when I spoke to them, I was speaking to a lighthouse that I looked to in really dark times and, you know, influences that, guided me to become the person that I, I am today. Yeah. And it's funny, we were talking about narcissism earlier, and I feel like narcissism is part of it because their relationship to themselves and their self-hatred or self-aggrandizement or whatever it was, was so large that it didn't leave room for them to see the person speaking to them and what that might have meant. Yeah. And I try to do the same thing. I mean, I'm not near, I, or sorry, I try to do the opposite. <laughs> um, but like, I'm don't not, go up to Steve, Stevie. Don't, I'll, like, I'll I'll ruin ruin it. Um, but like, I, I, you know, I'm not nearly at that level yet. Or maybe it's just that I don't see myself as being at that level yet. But like, you know, we had an experience on tour uh, in 2019. We were on an arena tour 
uh, across Canada. And at the merch table, people would come up to us and, you know, you give them a hug and they're like shaking because they're so excited to meet you. And I try to remember like wherever I am right now, whatever I'm dealing with, because touring is a mental health nightmare. Oh yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about that, but please. It's a minefield dude. But I tried to remember wherever I was with myself that this moment was an opportunity. They're not talking to me. They're talking to whatever version of themselves I represent for Mm -hmm. them. And it's usually a good one. They're usually talking to me because there's something that they see in me that they want to cultivate in themselves. Um, A confidence or a creativity um, or an ability to talk about certain things with my music. Uh, they're, They're trying to catch something that they can then use and say, I can be like that. I can do that too. Mm -hmm. So it's not about what kind of day I had. It's about receiving them, receiving that energy and, and mirroring it and supporting them right back. I try to do it. I can't always do it, but Mm -hmm. like, I honestly, it was those shitty experiences that I talked about earlier that made me realize how important that is because man, you got, you have one you you catch someone on the, on a bad day and you've been listening to their shit for five years, you know, you have their lyrics tattooed on your arm and you happen to meet them at the wrong time on the wrong day. And they're a piece of shit to you. Uh, and like, you don't look, it's, it's both sides, right? Because on the other hand, like, you don't know, maybe, maybe my fucking dog just died. Right. Uh, You got to leave room for that. But we don't. We don't as people. We don't leave room for that. We don't go, I don't know the whole story. I mean, it's like when you're driving, right? Someone cuts you off or someone's driving too slow in front of you. You don't go, oh, well, maybe it's a mom. She's got a birthday cake in the back. She can't go that fast. No, you go, this person is an asshole. Yeah, fuck you, speed up. (laughs) Yeah, fuck you, speed up. (laughs) I'm very guilty of that. And it's so... Uh. So I don't know. So I I don't really know what point I was making, but I think I'm saying that I really try Mm -hmm. as an artist when I'm in my zone as an artist, when I'm at the merch table or whatever, and people are talking to me, I just try to be there for them and make sure that whatever version of me they see is one that is going to encourage them to be their best as well. But then I also think I migrated towards a different point, which is people have bad days sometimes. So fuck off. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and that's how, and, and I, I feel for performers in that way. You know, anybody artists, anybody spotlight, whatever it is, is that it's 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 situations they can't they're not allowed that. Like I I uh. I hearken back to and I don't remember if I spoke with him about this or if I heard it somewhere or read it. But I had Eric Bischoff, uh, you know, WCW back in the day, worked with Hulk Hogan. And I, I think it was a, a different thing, maybe in one of his audiobooks, And he's talking about him, how he go like you know terry right like everybody just pictures and everything else and he goes because brother they don't care that my knees are bad my back is bad they care that they that day they're not they're not coming up to meet terry bolea they're coming up to meet hulk hogan and it might be the only time they get to do so like he was making reference that you know when he was out with his family eating at restaurants and people would come up he would get up from the table and take pictures and everything else and yeah and it and it's tough because i could see for me I'm a guy where I'll have some of my recovery friends like, dude, are you okay? This is on the weekend. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Why? Well, because I see a bunch of stuff on social media and I'm like, I turn my alerts off on all that shit. Yeah. <laughs> and if I need a break on the weekend, I don't look, I don't go on. Yeah. If I if I don't have some content to produce, to put out, to inspire, uh, whatever it is to connect, I stay off. For me, yeah, I just man. know I have to do that. I had a friend recently who um, had, had texted me. Uh, they they were just asking like what I was up to or whatever. You know, they wanted to hang out. And I was like, not in a great place. Didn't really want to interact with anyone. And then I had like posted something on my Instagram story. And they start texting me being like, I know you're on your phone because you posted to your Instagram story, you know, respond. And I had to be like, look, 
you don't have a right to my time by nature. Mm -hmm. I am happy to share it with you when it's good for both of us. And if you need something, if there's something serious, I'm there. But just because I have my phone in my hand doesn't mean that I have to respond to you. And it's a very recent thing mm -hmm. that that expectation is there. Or like for work shit, you know? People email you at 5 p.m. on a Friday. And then they email you at 10 a.m. on a Monday. And they go, hey, it's been three days. Noticed you haven't gotten back. You go, no, it's been one hour. It's been one working hour mm -hmm. that I haven't responded to you. That's how you should be treating this right now. But people, but we don't live in that world anymore. No, and you're right. And I haven't thought of it that way. That, thank you for sharing that. I've not thought of it that it's that is it, one working hour. I I I was worse for it than most. Like I I would do the same thing, and I mm -hmm. expected that of myself. Like mm -hmm. if you know if I got an email on a Saturday night, I should respond to it. It doesn't matter where I was or what I was doing. Like and especially like we work in an industry that moves so fast. Uh, it, so I put that expectation on myself, and at a certain point, it became untenable. And mm -hmm. so I I kind of I cycle. I'll still probably email back within an hour because I'm compulsive and because I'm manic a lot of the time mm -hmm. uh, and because my anxiety keeps me from giving myself the space and the time that I should. Yeah. But I no longer expect other people to act that way <laughs> just because I do. Well, that's a very strong thing to recognize is that that's owning yourself right there. Yeah. Stevie. I'm I able mean, to it recognize is. it for hours at a time <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. tough though it's tough to get to that point with ourselves and yeah, and to man. accept it you know i work this way but the world doesn't work this way that yeah that was one of the toughest things for me and still is in in my sobriety it's like you know hey i don't believe that if if something matters that you can't work through a situation or scenario with another or other people or whatever it is you know, there's so many easy misunderstandings, but some people, they're just, it's not in them. They don't have that. And I just have to accept, okay, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I hearken back to, uh, to a Captain Kirkism I'm showing my geekdom where, uh, where he said, I forget what movie, I don't believe in the no win scenario. And I used to be mm. that way. And now sometimes yeah. I have to go, okay, well, maybe the win is this person no longer wants to connect in any way, shape or form. And I just have mm. to let that play out. And I can't control it. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What What was it that was the the thing that finally made you go? All right, it's it's sobriety for me. It's not some level of moderation. It's it's not you know I can't control this. I need to be done with it. Uh, it's totally AA first step stuff. I am powerless against alcohol. Mm -hmm. It just. And I tried moderation and I had the rules and I'll only yeah. drink wine. I'll only drink on Fridays. I won't have anything in the house. It's only hard liquor if I'm out, um, yeah. you know, and, and I went through a very, 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 very tumultuous relationship that, that necessarily isn't any better. And I didn't want to live then to the point of, uh, of an attempt, um, mm. you know, thank, thank, yeah. you know, the, as I say, the God I do business for, um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah. I just I have my kids, and I went. I don't want to leave them uh, the same kind of scars. You know, I didn't really see my dad use per se, but there was something mm. where I started to realize I see myself repeating so many family patterns that have been there for generations that I don't want to do that anymore. And I want my kids to know that if I can do this, that they don't ever have to go down that road. And if they do, I got their back. And a really cool community of other people will have their back too. And so for me, it was just, yeah, I'm powerless. I continue to just surround myself with unhealthy people. And I just saw my life turning to, to nothing, you know, I, mm -hmm. for me, the rock bottom, it wasn't, wasn't jail time. Although I did up in, up in the silver bracelets once, um, <laughs> it, it, you know, anklet, my, I got, ended up getting, you know, the fucking um, God, yeah, all the probation. Jewelry. Yeah. Probation and all that shit. And, you know, and it's like, God, I don't, 
I was such a motivated individual. Like when I got in radio at 21, like where did all that go? Hmm. Where did all that go? Like, I, yeah, I just don't want to be this anymore. So yeah. yeah, I just had to change, uh, change one thing about myself. That's everything. Thank you for sharing that with me. Oh, thank you for asking. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you know, all, all, all thoughts that are circling me now. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, I was fully sober for about two months, uh, and the process of writing this album actually. Wow. Um, and they were like the most productive months of my life. It was, it was nuts. I couldn't believe I wrote half of the songs or I, I started half of the songs on this project during that time. Wow. Uh, and it was so good. And then I just kind of slipped back, you know? Yeah. Um, it's easy to do. Yeah. It's easy to do, especially I know this for me. I, I, I got, I think maybe the opposite of you. I got to a mm-hmm. point where people always, you know, what, what were you trying to escape? I got to a point where sober, I was so numb that it seemed mm-hmm. the only time in my drunken perception that I was experiencing joy and pleasure and interaction and everything else was uh, if I have a few in me at least, you know, cause it wasn't always, I didn't always drink to the point of getting drunk or blackout drunk for that matter. No, but I get it. You like your, your situation kind of moves from where you're here when you're sober, but you're so used to being up here that you need just, just to feel normal. Yeah. You need to have a few, cause that becomes the new normal. And then, but, but it just, the target keeps moving, right? Exactly. Exactly. And and our, and our brains, our chemical balancing works that way. Well, you know, Mm -hmm. naturally the human mind and, and chemicals want homeostasis. It wants to be this thing. So if you're way the hell up there, eventually your body's going to want to drop back down, you know? And, and I went through that stuff too. It was very familiar. You know, I was that way with relationships. I explored sex and love addiction too, you know? And, Testify. Yeah. So it's like, fuck, I, 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 A, I would like to have a healthy relationship. So I don't want to keep pissing through those every, you know, two years at, at the max. And, mm-hmm. you know, so yeah, I just wanted to, I, yeah, I just got to a point. I went, I, I looked up and basically was like, I'm, I'm powerless against this. I need help. I yeah. need help, you know, and it took a few tries. I had some good stints, like a year and a half fall off. Then, was on it for about another year or two, then two and a half years fall off, and then I am where I am now. Man. Took some time. Yeah, as it will. As it will. Yeah, man. Uh, touring, mental health touring. Tell yeah. me, because and when you say that, this is what I, when people go, ah, oh, these bands, I don't get it. They get paid all this money, and they're going around the world. I went, I went to <laughs> Europe. What money? Right? <laughs> yeah. I went, yeah, for the majority. Yeah, what money? Yeah. I went to Europe for 32 days. By the end, I was drinking every day. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, just to identify like the financial part of it for a moment, you can get to a point as an artist for sure where there's a lot of money, but when you're starting out, and especially when you're a rock band or an alternative band, you know, when you're not a pop act, um, you're playing a lot of these shows for enough money to get to the next show. Mm-hmm. And the venue always sweetens the pot. They're like, but here's a case of beer, you know, here's 24 <laughs> beers or as many, you know, whatever you want to drink. And it's always unhealthy food, uh, shit tons of drinks. Um, and yeah, just enough money to get to the next show. And it's a situation where all it can feed is itself. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, which is really dangerous. And then on top of that, you know, to stay at that level, it's <sighs> touring is wild because you go from sitting in the van, having a shitty night's sleep on, you know, a paper thin hotel mattress and get up at 9 a.m pile all your gear into the car hope it wasn't stolen from the van the night before you get in drive to the next spot you're exhausted you've told every joke to your band over the last five years there's nothing left to talk about um and then you get to the venue and you sound check generally with a house tech who stopped enjoying music many years ago <laughs> And then the show happens 
and it's lights and it's the audience and it's everyone singing along every word. And they've been looking forward to this for a full year and they're sending all of this energy towards you and you catch it. And it's like surfing. The wave turns around and you ride that thing all the way into shore. And it's the greatest feeling ever. It's a high. Um, and then the show ends. And you go to the merch table and you talk to people and they tell you what it meant and people show you tattoos and, you know, people buy you drinks. And then the venue empties out and you pile all your shit back into the van and there's that silence again, just waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And it's been there the whole time. It's been there the whole time. You're just able to look past it for a little bit at all of the other things that come in front of it. And you repeat that cycle again and again and again. I want to say touring's also the best. I love it. <laughs> it's also like, I'll, I'll get into the other side of it in a minute, but like, it's a roller coaster of emotion. You go from the highest highs for an hour to this absolute drop. And then you put your body and your mind through that again and again. And then you medicate with alcohol and whatever mm -hmm. um, in order to either get yourself back up to the energy that you need to be at on stage or to calm yourself down because you, the adrenaline is just pumping through you after a show. And you need to find a way to get to bed. And you need to get to bed in, in Canada, at least when you're touring through Canada, pretty quick because it's probably six hours of driving to the next venue. Um and you don't have time to work out properly and you're eating at a gas station because, you know, you, you the sound check just got pushed up to 430. Um, so, like, you know, it's really tough. Now, here's the other side. I love the road with everything in my body. It is also the place that taught me who I am and what I have to offer both myself and the world um sharing my music is the most special experience meeting the fans is the greatest thing and that feeling of catharsis that happens when i go up there and i say i'm scared and everyone goes us too hmm. and then we dance about it and we let that fear become a celebration and we're not alone anymore. Uh, and we're not afraid to share it because we all feel it. And we name the beast and we take its power away. Mm. For those beautiful moments, everything is right. And everything is good. And my work and my life has meaning. And everything that's happened before that's taken me to that place is worth it because I look out there and I've helped some people and I wouldn't trade that for anything. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point for some people, the roller coaster of it all just becomes too much or their coping mechanisms are off and what they do in order to make it tenable uh, either becomes more important or more powerful than the experience itself. Yeah. And I've seen that happen to people. I think in moments it's happened to me. Um, but that's it, right? But what are you going to do? Are you going to stop? I can't. Unless you touch that. I I just feel like there's no going back. Yeah. I can only imagine. Well, and I can... I mean, I you can because you've been I on guess stage I can, and right. shared that, Right. Yeah, I guess that is true. I mean, I've brought in some pretty big name bands on before and just getting to cheer from their fans, like, you know, going, are you ready to see, you know, whatever? It's like, yeah, it's an extraordinary, just like, yeah, like you said, that energy, you know, yeah. um, phenomenal, phenomenal. I, I have this thing, though, because everyone, you know, whenever you go, like, how's everyone doing tonight? Everyone always goes, woo, right? Yeah, I want to start encouraging my fans to b be honest. How are you all yeah. doing tonight? Very unwell. <laughs> How are you all doing tonight? I cried twice on my way here. <laughs> uh, 
you're like, I want, that's what I want. How are you all doing tonight? Bad. Great. Let's do something about that. Sure. No, I mean you, sir. You in particular. You. How are you? Well, what happened? Yeah. My ex-wife just hit me with another lawsuit and, you know, but, but I'm fucking here, man. Yeah. I hear you. I feel you. I have a song that vaguely applies to that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Well, and like, that's a lot of what the album is. That's what I say. Let's talk uh, everything you want. The Birds of Bellwoods album. Let's let's talk about it real quick before we jump to some random questions. Sounds great. Tell me. So, you, like you said, you had about that two month gap where you were producing a lot of the material for this album. Yeah, I'm also very proud to say that this album, more than uh, some of the music that came before it, was really the most we've ever worked together and collaborated as a band to mm -hmm. create music holistically. Like I can truly say that all of the songs on this album wouldn't exist if we all hadn't touched them and shared our own personal experiences. Um, and I think we did it really successfully. Writing music as a group is so hard because you're simultaneously sharing something that is so precious and intimate and unique to your own heart. Mm -hmm. And then you're offering it this little baby bird and it might not be good. <laughs> <laughs> you might have just had the most harrowing experience of your life. And the only thing that may have gotten you through that is writing about it. And then you might go, yeah. And someone might go, yeah, but that's not really a chorus, is it? Uh, and then you have to step past your ego and go like, yeah, shit. Okay, you're right. You're right. It means more to me than it does to the people who are going to hear it. Um, I describe it sometimes as like trying to have four hands on one pencil and write a poem. Mm. Sometimes you're all on the same page. Sometimes it pulls violently in other directions. But I was really proud of the bravery that we were all able to bring to the table and share these like dark, scary pieces of our lives and of our experiences. Mm. And I think it's in sharing them and in kind of shouting them together that we found the sound of this album and that these songs that are on paper very sad uh, became this really positive, happy album. Um, because it's like I was saying with the live show, when you say it together, when you name the beast, you take its power. Right. Um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that uh, every song on that project is about anxiety, sadness, uh, hurt, the fear of getting older, um, a desire to disappear completely, uh, a feeling of not being worth it, mm -hmm. uh, or of the experience of of continuing to engage with this life not being worth it. Uh, and somehow, despite the lyrics all <laughs> coming from this very dark place, it feels like a celebration yeah. of life and of the struggle. And yeah. that's what the show feels like, too. I love it, man. Uh, yeah. you got, do you know if you're going to be touring in the States at all? We're looking at dates right now. Sweet. Uh, we're, we are starting to look at dates uh, right now. Um, we're looking at hitting... Detroit and Chicago and a couple of other places, Minneapolis, our streaming numbers skew eight to one states to Canada, huh. despite the fact that we're a Canadian band. And I can't get to the bottom of it. I've been trying to figure this out. You want me to tell you why? Yes, please. It is my perspective as someone that, you know, they say normally as you get older, you just kind of stick with the, the songs that were hits for you and the stuff. Like I'm a new music junkie. I'm always looking for something new. Uh, you know, the person that connected us, I'm like, uh, can you send me the song before, you know, send me the single. Uh, that was my question before. Like, yeah, I was like, oh yeah, no, I want to talk to Stevie. This is some cool shit right here. I dig this stuff. You know, like I think there's so many young people for the most part that are really 
my favorite Walt Whitman quote here. Always be curious, mm-hmm. not judgmental, that they're just really curious. And I think there's such a lineage of still with Canada where it's not uh, it's not homogenized in the way that mm-hmm. a lot of like state side side stuff just is like so much, mm-hmm. especially pop music. It's like in rap. I'm, I'm like, OK, you know, maybe it is me being old, but some of the shit sounds exactly the same. <laughs> it, 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 like did the same producer do all the top 10 hits here or yes what? actually yes <laughs> right so it becomes just homogenized and i think there's so many people that are just it blows me away when i talk to young people that they're digging uh for something new something different something outside of the box something that isn't necessarily the big quote-unquote pop culture thing or uh you know if i talk about a lot of the quote now classic rock artists or or even the newer ones oh yeah no i've interviewed them met them whatever it is they're blown away you know like oh yeah i my dad would listen to that you know and he was really big on x band or whatever it was so you know there's a deep catalog and so i think it's just the, the the being like curious and it's funny um when something's good though stevie it's good it's okay to accept that are you saying my music's good uh, when something's good, Stevie, it's okay to accept that it's good. You know what? Yes. I'll take it. For the first yes. time today, this is the moment where I'm going to say, okay, it's good. It's yeah. good music. Yeah. No, I fucking love it. I mean, the other cool thing is that when you collaborate with with four other people or more than that, you know, with the producer and we had Stefan from Pop help us write one song, um, I'm able to say this album is fucking amazing because even if, you know, the self uh, effacing part of me wants to be down on myself. There are five people that I adore and that I think are so talented and they made a great album that I was also a part of. So even if I wanted to be self effacing, I am still able to say, yeah, it's incredible because I'm going to big up, you know, my team. Yeah. Well, and you This is a real way of sidestepping the compliment you just gave <laughs> Dude, hey, I'm learning too. It's hard to just go, thanks. Thanks. Here, yeah. let me try it. Thanks. It feels weird, doesn't it? Yeah, it did. It felt weird. Yeah. No, yeah. trust me. I know. I know. But the other thing with the curiosity that you were just talking about is, is you know, I think the last point on that is we talked a bit about, you know, the, the bad side of social media and, and, and the... Uh, insecurities that are arriving because of things like Instagram and TikTok. But the other side of it is that it's showing people as well as a whole lot of bullshit that they don't need to see and that's messing them up. It's also showing them media and art and perspectives from around the world that they might never otherwise have seen. And I think that's part of the reason why people's taste is so varied now, especially younger people is because they're finding that they're just scrolling through. And like one of my favorite artists right now is an artist named Medium Build. He's from Alaska. Hmm. I would never have found him if I hadn't been scrolling through TikTok, found one of his songs and just been hit in the chest by it. All right. Yeah. So there's a good side. I mean, it's the singularity. We're moving towards the bad and the good are just so close to each other. At the end of the day, too, uh, you know, as, as I'll preach, is every it comes back to personal responsibility. You have to recognize how does that thing make me think or feel and yeah. or feel. And if you realize it's shitty, well, it's on you. Mm. It's on you, you know? I mean, it just, that, that welcome to life, man. <laughs> but all right, we're going to jump into some random questions. How about it? Let's do it. Hit me. Uh, all right. Here we go. Random questions. Of course, brought to you by 5150 LTM. My sponsor couldn't do it without them. Click the link in the podcast description. 20% off in the store when you use code KDD. Biggest musical influence. Oh, man. That really changes uh, very rapidly. Uh, I would say on this project, some of the ones I'd have to mention would be uh, Matt Mason, mm. uh, Hippocampus. Phoebe Bridgers, uh, Chris would insist that I mention the Beach Boys. Uh, <laughs> mm. I, I'm also, yeah, there's this new artist that I'm listening to a lot, Medium Build from Alaska. Please take us on tour if you don't mind. Um, check him out. And then I also, I listen to like a wide variety of stuff. Uh, so biggest musical influence right now. Also, there's a there's an artist 
uh, from Puerto Rico called Young Miko that hmm. I I'm crazy about right now. Uh, yeah, I would say those are a few. Also, like Delta era Mumford and Sons, and mm. oh shit, and I will always come back to Third Eye Blind, who <laughs> were a very important band for me growing up. And I think when I listen to the album, I think still the closest thing I'd compare it to is Third Eye Blind. Right on. I dig it, man. And we got to have that stuff. I love it. And I'm the same way. It's like if you ask me my favorite movie or song or whatever, it's going to change from day to day. Yeah. It just is. That's just how it is. Uh, Well, go ahead then. Okay. Your favorite (laughs) top five artists for you right now. Uh, Well, since I've been taking bass lessons, uh, a lot of Kiss. I'm a big Mm. Kiss fan. Um, I've dicked around with Motley Crue music since I was young uh i mean that was probably next to prince my biggest inspiration i was like six years old and my brother we had our cousin nikki ironically enough she brought a copy yeah. of shout at the devil the record you uh-huh. know aging myself which just had the black satin pentagram and at like six years old i knew that was bad you open the the fold uh-huh. and it's these dudes that look fucking scary and gnarly and then you put on the album and it starts with you know in the beginning this ominous like dark you know satanic type sounding thing and then that first chord from shout at the devil that man that, you know that did it for you hey that yeah, was, I was it. like oh you know and then metallica of course um that's other stuff my music teacher has uh been we've been dicking with some metallica chili peppers kiss um, um prince prince is always in there if you're getting into bass you should listen to thundercat thundercat i will write that down thundercat uh, is going to mess you up so if it was today, God, that's fucking tough, man. That's yeah, tough. Well, like-, like, yeah, like, how do you narrow it down? You know, I don't know, yeah. man. It's uh, you know, and then if you were just like, well, but I liked Prince with these musicians, and I liked you know with the, it's like, oh, good God, I could yeah, go with Stevie hard. Wonder. I I adore Stevie Wonder, one of my all time favorites. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, I'm a blues guy too. You know, love. I just think he's the most brilliant blues player for my taste ever. And, you know, I could go on and on. David Bowie, Queen. uh, Mm. uh, You know, I'm more of a Beethoven guy than a Bach or Chopin like my kids like. You know, let's let's go on and on. There's more Tchaikovsky uh, on my end. Oh, I think my son's really into Tchaikovsky right now. That guy, you would have had a fascinating interview with him. He had some issues Let me tell you. <laughs> rot individual oh uh, i uh, mean who didn't <laughs> who didn't yeah well and you've got that kind i have a theory when you have that kind of a mind um my my girlfriend and i were talking about this when you have that kind of a mind like and you're around musicians all the time it just be some you can be a little bit odd because i think your brain works in a different way to be able to um uh, you know like was it was it Coltrane that was in prison? I'm trying to remember what jazz musician, but he would write on his prison wall and wow. he would look at it and somebody asked him about it and he's like, oh, I can hear it. Mm. When he was when he was writing all of the notation, he's like, I can hear it. I know exactly That's what so it sounds wild. like, you know. Uh, uh, John Williams, modern composer, my favorite, did all Star Wars, Jaws, everything else. I took my kids to see Star Wars live with a symphony playing along and i'm like oh my how did this guy just like see these scenes and come up with these themes and it, yeah. being that live i felt like the five-year-old kid that saw star wars for the first time like i i'm literally i'm like <laughs> and crying mm-hmm. and you know it's like wow just the brilliant mind to be able to see and do that yeah yeah man i had a artist i toured with who described it as being close to the veil Mm. Um, this idea that there's this spiritual world around us and some people are just brushing up against it, you know? Mm. Yeah. And so they hear it, they can, they can see the shadows past it and they can hear it right beside them. Um, and that's where good things can come in, but also where, where worse things can come in. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I, I think that's so true when you, you know, I think back to about addiction, I think in a weird way, I was trying to play god or meet god at the same time you should have done ayahuasca you only have to do it once (laughs) (laughs) i've had people tell me that and i'm like i'm i'm really afraid because i'm the kind of guy i can get hooked into things you i promise you well you know what i'm not going to make any promises or anything like that but i will say that that's not 
I, I don't know of anyone that addiction has become, you know what, but I'm speaking out of turn. I don't know enough about it, but I will say that I know a lot of people that it has helped them cure their addictions. That's I know what many I people that have come into that experience with alcoholism or with very unhealthy habits um, and have walked out and never drank again. Yeah, so that's what I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> it's fucking nuts man it's wild it changed a lot for me. i'm afraid of it that's all i'll leave it there so maybe it's a fear fear, fear is a sign of respect uh mm. it, it, you're you're right to be afraid but the the i will also say that you the universe is a, is at its core a deeply loving place and it's I, as I'm... curious about us as we are of it and uh that fear is replaced by love quickly when you're on the right journey mm. i believe that uh, I, yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with you there. Absolutely. Yeah. But make sure your shaman is a real shaman <laughs> because a lot of people will say in, in some of those communities will say that they are a shaman. They are not. Uh, uh, it can be very dangerous. Yeah. I don't want to go. Uh, hi, I'm George. This is my first time. Uh, I was down in Peru. I was in Aikido. So there's literally guys like, hey, do you want a bracelet? No, I'm good. He's like, cool. You want to come to my garage, do ayahuasca? I'm a shaman. I'm like, I don't. A minute ago, you were a, you made bracelets. <laughs> You're also like, I, I, you know, I have several jobs myself, but that I feel like a shaman. That's like a fairly that's a specialized job. Sure. That's like no one's like, hey, I'm a brain surgeon. I also <laughs> moonlight as a taxidermist. And I'm like, no, that feels like things that should be separate. Yeah, let's say a little crowbar here. Yeah. Anyhow, sorry. I'm. We're, we're, no, we're <laughs> it's fun. Mm. Uh, and that's a great name for a band too, by the way. I might add that close to the veil. If that's not out there yet, that needs to be. Or that's an album or song title. Piercing the veil, I think, is a band already. I, th I think you're right. Hmm. Close to the veil, though. That's close to that's, the veil is nice. That's, that's our side project. When you get a little better at that bass. <laughs> All right. That's a really compelling. Just like. Even how you put it like that, you know, that that like light and dark and it's like just such a thin line. Anyways, I could go forever. Random questions. Yeah. Uh, pet peeves. Shit that just annoys you. Uh, I don't like when people say sure. Like if I'm like, hey, do you want uh, are you hungry? Do you want to get dinner now? And someone goes, sure. Or like, uh, do you want to watch this? Sure. What are you up to tonight? Do you want to hang out? Sure. Sure to me means no, but fine. <laughs> and I, I can't, I just either a yes or no, or elaborate a little bit. Sure. Feels very dismissive to me. I can, I think you can tell how much it pisses me off. Also typos in emails. Ooh. Take a minute, take a minute, look through your email. Uh, we have autocorrect on our phone now. There's no reason there should be a typo. It belies a level of, uh, well, I mean, no, it doesn't. This is me being extremely judgmental, but it says to me that someone doesn't have attention to detail. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I would I would agree with that. As someone that's dyslexic uh, with all these tools now, if, if I send something and it's wrong, it's, it's because I didn't pay enough time and attention. But perfect example of what I was talking about earlier, where sometimes you don't know the whole story. If someone's dyslexic and I'm getting mad at them over a typo. That's that's bullshit on my part. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think that's a part of owning things, right? Owning our thoughts and emotions. Oh, and asking questions during movies. Oh! Because oh. while you're asking that question more is being revealed that you are now going to have to ask me about. And it's just like, once you start that cycle, it's never going to end. Also, I, I might be watching this movie for the first time now. Maybe we don't know. Maybe we don't know yet. Who is that guy? First time I'm seeing him. Something tells me in about five to 10 minutes, someone's going to go, oh, fucking Admiral Happenstance. Nice to see you. Glad yep. you're back. Exactly. I've gotten to the point I will tell people that now. I had a friend here that he and I he and I would intentionally go to the movies together cuz we knew we wouldn't say a single fucking thing during a film. I'm in. I will yeah. come with you guys. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh mm. uh I don't know if I, being that you are an actor if I how should I ask this? 
Uh, I'll either ask any one superpower, if you could have any one superpower, what would it be? Or if you could play any one superhero, who would it be? Oh, um, man, that's really hard. Uh, maybe time travel mm. or teleportation. Those would both be great. Although I'm I'm Jewish and I have red hair, so the time travel thing would probably be limited at a certain point. But I could check the future. How, how does how does being Jewish and a redhead prevent you from time travel? Well, there was a period of time before which uh, Jews uh, oh. we, we wouldn't have had a great time. Good <laughs> if, point. If Good I point. Went, if I went back, like even in Canada before like the '60s, I, it, it wouldn't have been fantastic for me. Um, and the red hair thing, you go back far enough, people think I'm somehow uh, touched by the devil or something Good like point. that. Um, You're far more forward cool. thinking on that than I was. Uh, yeah, I just maybe just more cautious, maybe just more anxious. Um, <laughs> so maybe maybe teleportation. Teleportation would be cool. But I, and no, this is going to keep me up all night now because it's, and I, I said something and I'm going to wish I said something else. We're moving past it. <laughs> let um, it go let it go forever or, or being able to like uh change yourself like Morph. uh transmogrification yeah. to an animal or like another person you know like that'd be that'd be pretty fucking wild too um who would i like to play as a superhero oh man the joker i know he's oh, not a hero but i'm gonna go joker or you know what riddler they would both be a blast, wouldn't they? I, I would do well with them. Um, but then, like, you know what? I'd love to be Spider-Man. I don't think I'm past a time where I could be Spider-Man. So I feel like I would suit Spider-Man. Yeah, I you think know? so. I think they that- crush that. I think the the heart that you have and that you've shared here would be very good Peter Parker. Yeah, man. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I accept that compliment. Good. But boy, mm. playing the Riddler or Joker would be a blast. I think I do the Riddler a lot better than the Joker, though. Yeah. The, I mean, the Joker now, like Heath Ledger's performance was obviously uh, untouchable. And then further to that, uh, oh, who's the name of the actor? It was in the deleted scene from the Robert Pattinson one. Barry oh, Pattinson yeah. Or some shit. His Joker was, I was like, oh, this you yeah you're doing like you're holding up yeah you won't be made a no one will make a fool of you for the next 15 years sorry yeah. jared leto yeah. <laughs> i Such know talented actor sacrificial lamb someone had to play the joker after heath ledger and no one was gonna like it no matter who it was no and, and it what that's absolutely true in so many situations where that happens where it's just like yeah. n nobody's gonna like this you're, yeah. you're you're just you're fucked before go yeah 100%. <laughs> you know especially yeah, with the man. way in which they kind of framed it and it was just yeah. like man, it, it was pretty much like this isn't our joker mm -mm. oh it sucks you know academy award winner i i've met him before to me he was very kind um yeah. when he was in 30 seconds to mars or still doing that actively you know um but yeah i mean jesus <laughs> you know yeah man i mean dallas sure. buyers club that role it's like oh, okay incredible how uh who would you what superpower would you want i waffle on this one but my i stick with usually healing like if somebody like not necessarily save their life but if i could ease someone's pain you know maybe at the end or through a trauma that they maybe they would be able to frame it differently and and you know prosper and yeah i Can think I tell it comes, you something yeah you might already have that power well thank you of course man give me chills i hope i don't know it for mm. me it comes from um i was in the room with both my grandmas when they passed and and mm. so it was you know one was on hospice and the other was just painful and gone and so yeah it's always stuck with me as far as the superhero yeah. though batman I don't need any superpowers. Just give me a lot of money and a lot of ingenuity. Here you go. Yeah, man, Batman. I still don't know if we should be calling him a superhero. Yeah. Rich guy beats up Jaywalker. <laughs> yeah, you know, 
<laughs> oh shit that's uh, too good what kind of role uh appeals to you uh i have played kind of further down the call sheet as an actor for quite a while mm-hmm. um and i would love to have the responsibility of carrying a project uh at some point that's very important to me i love characters uh I'm proud to not look like the most traditional, you know, cookie cutter. Like I wouldn't play Superman, you know what I mean? And like, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, I love characters. I love period pieces and I love complicated characters as well. Um, I like being someone who appears to be a bad guy. uh, But the more you get to know them, the more you resonate with the experiences that made them that. And perhaps in the end they are redeemed. Uh, an actor whose career I really admire is someone like uh, Aiden Gillian, mm. uh, who played Littlefinger in uh, Game of Thrones. But I first saw him in The Wire, playing Mayor wow. Carcetti. And then he also plays Aberama Gold in uh, Peaky Blinders. And that's like three completely different characters, completely different voices, different eras. Um and such commanding performances. Yeah. And he, you know, he also has his own show that he gets to take care of. But like, you know, he's he's a huge actor. He's been in three of the most successful television franchises ever. Uh but he go he comes in, he does his stint, he's a character that you're obsessed with, and then he disappears and he's on to the next project. That's yeah. the kind of career I want to have. Those are the kind of roles I want to play. And uh, I'd like to be in a Marvel. <laughs> Because fucking why not? Uh, how could you like? Okay, so I've done some acting. Uh, that's what I went to college for, actually, film and television directing for the camera. Major minor was acting for the camera. Uh, you know, did some small films and stuff like that. But how could you not? Like, they just it just seems like so much fucking fun. It does. Oh man, but you know, like the more fun and crazy stuff is on screen the more it was just like, okay, now go like this. Yeah. Cool. Let's that's the day. Yeah. You know, like, like some of those movies are like, I think the little mermaid that's coming out, I think they shot like maybe 80 seconds of footage a day, maybe, you know, on like a really good day. Yeah. You know, you're talking about, or like a third of a page sometimes. Sure. But it looks, I mean, it's, it's probably still fun as hell. Yeah. Oh, like or even anything in the Star Wars canon now with the TV oh, shows. God, Come on, that'd be I, so great. Yeah, put me, put me, put me in some Mandalorian armor or something. I'll stand there for six hours. You crush as a Mandalorian. I you fully give this is the way vibes. This, hey, this um, is the way. This, this is, <laughs> and for me, this is the way. This, this is the way. Like, this is this. <laughs> this is the way. Um, uh, we went, just saw 1917 last night, and like, oh, oh my god, can you imagine a one shot like that? I was up for a Broadway show too, and like, that'd be so cool. I want to do everything, man. Stage really is a blast, isn't everything. it? It's really, really special. Yeah, I don't it's, have, I don't have a good musical. I just don't have a good voice. Like I was telling you, I'm tone deaf. But doing ensemble stuff was fun. But plays, like you know, I just, I loved being that totally different, just like character just something just like it's also it's like a live show because once you start you just gotta go yeah and no matter what happens you roll with it now i'm thinking of the way you said it is like if it was christopher walken as a mandalorian wow this is the way, this is the way i guess yeah. i don't know <laughs> that's pretty good man thanks i used this to be bad in impressions back in the day uh I can, do, I can do a pretty good Bernie Sanders. That's really, I don't know why, but for some reason, I feel <laughs> quite confident in my ability to perform this role. Now you need to fall asleep. That's a Bernie Sanders. Just like I'm not wearing my mittens. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey, Stevie, the, uh, uh, if you want to learn anything from your experience, um, you know, be it, uh, you know, the stuff that you've faced with your mental health or anything else, um, you know, what might you lend to someone? That's a big question. Um, 
when it comes to love, I think it really is most important to love and take care of yourself first. Um, it's a beautiful thing to dedicate yourself to another person, but when you do that from a position of not being whole, then that relationship can uh, be like two drowning swimmers uh, mm -hmm. and they're both clinging to each other, but all you start to do is pull each other further underwater. Um, so I think there's that. Uh, take care of yourself in many ways. Another th Oh, everyone should be in therapy. Everyone in the entire world should be in therapy. It's wonderful. It's like a talk show where you're the only guest and all you do is talk about yourself, but you get to be a better person as a result of it. Um, I think it's helped me understand myself. It's helped me understand a lot of the people in my life that I came to odds with. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, if people don't have issues with schizophrenia or deeper mental health issues, I would say a small amount of hallucinogens are probably good for everyone uh, when taken in the right environment and under the right circumstances. <laughs> I think you can learn a lot very quickly with just uh, one little mushroom in your hand. Um, what else? Uh Surround yourself with people who love you and who see in you the person that you wish to nurture. Uh, the way that people see you from prolonged exposure will become who you are, uh, especially if you're in an outward facing job. So you need to have your inner circle tight. Uh, and you got to be people you can trust and people who believe in you. I'm, I got a little ahead of myself there. Um, what else? What else have I learned? Uh, <laughs> uh, have a good skincare routine. <laughs> no one, no one, no adult should eat dairy. It's weird. <laughs> um, oh, and. Uh, when you are in the worst of it, if you are a writer, just start writing. Don't edit. Just get to the page and just cry all over that thing and pour all of it out, all of it out. And then eventually, when you're at a better time, you'll come back to it and you'll see it all. And there are these gems. I think of it kind of like this. The darkness, the sadness is like a pool. And there be treasure at the bottom of that pool. But you can't stay down there for too long or you'll drown. So you let yourself sink in. You hold your breath. You go. You pull what you can. You come back up. Mm -hmm. That's not what I want to end it on, though. Don't be self-indulgent. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, hydrate. Drink more water, everyone. Yeah. Just drink more water. I don't drink enough water. No one drinks. No one is drinking enough water. No one I know is drinking enough water. <laughs> we, we oh, must, and have circle. a conversation with your parents that you need to have because there's no fishing trip. There's not going to be a moment where you finally uh, have that conversation until you initiate it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or cut them out of their your light. No, scratch that last one. Because what if your parents are just pieces of shit? Then yeah. just then leave it be. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Probably the first one was the best one. Sometimes that's just how it is. Unhealthy yeah. people are unhealthy people. Yeah. Yeah, man. You yeah. can try. You can try your best. Uh, but some people... Well, it comes back to that, man. If people don't help themselves, then you can't really help them. Y your habits come to define you. And your habits aren't just the things you do consciously. They're also the things that you do unconsciously. So be aware of the patterns that you repeat, the more you repeat them, the harder they are to change. Uh, the album, of course, from uh, Birds of Bellwoods, uh, Everything You Want, it's out. The link is in the description of the podcast. Click that link, check it out. I've got it downloaded from my Apple Music. It's great stuff, man. Uh, Steve it's really good. I, I'm willing to acknowledge it now. It's a fucking yeah. amazing album. You're going to love it. Acknowledge it. Own that.
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, this has been this a is, man, you want to know the truth? I think it's yeah. the best rock album to come out of Canada in years. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about.